ঠিক আছে ইফতিকার শোনা যাচ্ছে তো হ্যাঁ ম্যাডাম শোনা যাচ্ছে দেখা যাচ্ছে আচ্ছা ঠিক আছে কোন সমস্যা নেই
Dear participants, thank you for your participation in this international webinar jointly organized by Department of Geology and Geography, Chakraho College. We are going to start our program after a few minutes. You are to please mute yourself. Please do not press present button. Dear participants, just we are going to start our program after a few minutes. Please cooperate us. Please mute your, your, yourself. Please do not press present button. Thank you. That's the fine much. RT Bhumik, please stop your presenting, please. Please, dear participant, please mute yourself. Please mute yourself. Swatish sir, please mute yourself.
Dear participant, thank you for your participation in this international webinar jointly organized by Department of Geology and Geography, Chakdaho College. We are going to start our program after a few minutes. Please kindly mute yourself and please do not press the present button. Please cooperate with us. Thank you. Mute yourself, please. All the participants are requested to mute yourself. Please, all the participants are requested to mute yourself. <laughs> All time I see that the All participants are requested to mute yourself. Please mute yourself. All participants are requested to mute yourself. All participants are requested, please mute yourself. Thank you, Pro Vice. 
Mission Sila, sir. Uh, good evening. Good evening to everybody. Uh, good evening. <laughs> Thank you. मंत्री जिओग्राफी चाद कलेज Biodiversity loss jeopardizes nature's vital contribution to humanity, enlarging economy, livelihood, food security, cultural diversity, and quality of life, and constitutes a major threat to global peace and security. New technology can contribute to the progress in. biodiversity and environmental studies today we have with us four eminent speaker from different discipline to deliver their knowledgeable speech on the topic from different angle now i would like to invite our honorable chairperson and patron of this webinar Dr. Shakuntala Das Mahanto, the principal of this college, rather I would say the inspiration hub of the college, to deliver our welcome address. Over to Dr. Shakuntala Das Mahanto. Ma'am, mute, 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 mute. स्वागत 
আমাদের ভীষণ ব্যস্ত মানুষ আমাদের খুব কাছের মানুষ তার কারণ আমাদের কলেজ পরিচালন সমিতির সম্মানীয় অতিথি তিনি সম্মানীয় মেম্বার সদস্য তিনি কল্যাণী বিশ্ববিদ্যালয়ে কর্মসূত্রে ছিলেন এর আগে সেই জন্য কল্যাণী বিশ্ববিদ্যালয়ের প্রতিনিধি হিসেবে আমাদের পরিচালন সমিতিতে কাজ করেছেন থেকেছেন এবং সবসময় পাশে থেকেছেন আজকে তিনি আরো উচ্চ পদে আসেন এবং আমি তাকে ব্যক্তিগত ভাবে সম্বর্ধনা জানালেও অভিনন্দন জানালেও সত্যি কথা বলতে কি এই লকডাউনের কারণে যে সময় তিনি আরো গুরু দায়িত্বে পৌঁছলেন গুরু দায়িত্ব নিলেন সেই সময় তাকে আমরা কলেজ থেকে সম্বর্ধনা জানাতে পারিনি কিন্তু আমাদের স্থির করা আছে যে আমরা অবশ্যই পরিস্থিতি স্বাভাবিক হলে স্যারকে সম্মান জানিয়ে নিজেরা সম্মানিত হব আমি বুঝতেই পারছেন আপনারা কারণ আমন্ত্রিতদের তালিকা আছে আপনাদের কাছে আমি স্বাগত জানাই শুভেচ্ছা জানাই অভিনন্দন জানাই ডক্টর আশিস পানি গ্রাহিকে যিনি এখন বর্ধমান বিশ্ববিদ্যালয়ের প্রো ভাইস চ্যান্সেলার আমাদের মধ্যে উপস্থিত আছেন আরো শিক্ষাবিদ তারাও কিন্তু প্রশাসনিক দায়িত্ব নিচ্ছেন এবং দক্ষতার সঙ্গে সামলাচ্ছে পিয়াল বসু রায়ও সেই দায়িত্বভার নিয়েছিলেন একটা সময় আমাদের মধ্যে উপস্থিত আছেন It is a pleasure and honor for me to welcome Dr. Raju Esar Adurai, Senior Research Associate, the University of Texas Health Science Center, Texas, United States. Thank you. Welcome, sir. Our first question is Dr. Shomnath Mukherjee. Assistant Professor, Bakura Christian College, West Bengal. Most welcome, all of you. Ajkir Alujana Shundhur Bhabe Shampar Nubo. Ami Abushri Shagato Janabo. Shamust the participants there. Amadir Dekir Bibhino Pranto Teke, Dekir Baide Teke, Nana Ustahi Manush Ekhanukositoetin. You all are welcome. আমি অবশ্যই ওয়েলকাম করব স্বাগত জানাবো আমার কলেজের অধ্যাপক অধ্যাপিকা কলেজের শিক্ষা কর্মী ছাত্রছাত্রীদের যারা এখানে উপস্থিত আছেন যারা প্রত্যক্ষে আছেন যারা নেপথ্যে থেকে কাজ করেছেন ইউ আর অল মোস্ট ওয়েলকাম আপনাদের সকলের চেষ্টায় আজকের অনুষ্ঠান সুন্দরভাবে সম্পন্ন হোক আমাদের আবার কখনো দেখা হবে এই প্রতিমারির কাল শেষ হলে ধন্যবাদ নমস্কার Thank you so much, Dr. Shagota Dasmohanto. We feel very privileged to have your supervision and supporting us all possible times. Now I'd like to request Professor Ashish Kumar Panikrai, sir, to deliver his valuable speech. Professor Panikrai is currently the Pro-Vice Chancellor of the University of Bordeaux. Former professor and head in the Department of Geology of the University of Kollani. He has many national and international publications in fishery science and ecotoxicology. He has received many national and international awards. He is having an active association with different societies and academics around the world. Over to Professor Ashish Panigrai, sir. Thank you very much. And good evening to everybody. First of all, I convey my heartfelt regards to my beloved principal of Narada College, Dr. Sagata Das Mahanta. She is very much close to me because I am still the university member of the governing body of Narada College. I am very much grateful to you, Madam, for inviting me in this international webinar. Then I thanks to the organizers, especially, especially the joint convenors of the uh, Department of Geology and the Department of Geography of Chagda College. Then I welcome to all the experts member 
resource person in this webinar, Italy Professor Bial Boturai, Dr. Raju from USA, and Dr. Sumnath Mukarji from Bakura Kistan College. During this pandemic situation, it is very relevant the topic of the webinar organized by the Chagda College under University of Poland. I want to say a few words before my lecture that due to COVID-19 pandemic throughout the world, we are passing a very critical phase in our day-to-day -day life. We have to depend on online activities. And due to this, this webinar has been arranged on online, not offline. That is not an international seminar, it is a webinar. The event speakers from the different parts and the participants, the teachers of the Chagda College and the staff members of the governing body as well as the other staff member of the college and the students of the college who are anxiously waiting for our lecture. I welcome also them. That is due to COVID-19 pandemic situation. We have to do something for the betterment of our mother earth. And this topic of webinar is very much relevant with the conservation strategies and the other ecological parameters measurement required in the present day scenario. So now I go to my, that, my topic. That is the, the present scenario of ornamental fish in India and their future scope. I will concentrate now with my lecture. Slides are okay. It is visible. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Visible. Okay, okay. Thank you. So, that, that, uh, the topic is the present scenario of ornamental fish in India and future scope. So, now I will say. What do you mean by ornamental fish? We know ornamental fish can be defined as attractive, colorful fishes or peaceful in nature, and they are kept as pet in confined spaces of an aquarium or a garden pool with the purpose of enjoying their beauty for fun and fancy. Ornamental fishes are also with all the live jewels for their beautiful colors and beautiful behavior. So criteria for selection of ornamental fishes. Now you can say these are the ornamental fishes. There are some criteria, some characteristics to select the ornamental fishes. The ornamental fishes selected should be attractive and brilliantly colored. Selected fishes should be compatible to each other. Fishes introduced into the aquarium should be healthy, disease free, and should be collected from the reliable sources so that we can avoid the infection. Fishes that are sluggish should be avoided. Behavior of the fishes should be lively 
with oil spread fins and should be actively swimming swimming the size of the fishes kept in the aquarium should be uniform as larger fishes may harm the smaller one so the present types of ornamental fishes according to their habitat the ornamental fishes are differentiated into two types one is the marine marine source and one is from the fresh water sources depend on their breeding habit the ornamental fishes are differentiated into two types one is the egg depositor who lay eggs and one is the life bearers who lay uh, life uh, fishes that is the spawn depend on the locality the ornamental fish are differentiated into two types one is indigenous which are available in the uh, fresh water resources and the exotic which are uh, which are available uh, from the foreign countries so example of the marine and fresh water breed of the some ornamental fishes these are the marine breed of the ornamental fishes and uh, in the right side there is the fresh water breed of the ornamental fishes these are the different types of breed of the both marine and and fresh water ornamental fishes an example of life bearer and egg depositors of ornamental fishes these are the life bearer ornamental fishes in the left side that is the guppy noli platy and short tail these are the life bearer ornamental fishes and egg depositors are the that is the barbs different type of barbs rasporas tetras and denios example of indigenous and exotic breed of the ornamental fish i have already presented and the objective of this study is to evaluate the present status of the ornamental fish trade in both india and world scenario to evaluate the problem faced by the ornamental fish farmers what are the problems the ornamental fish farmers face during their culture and trade and the, to evaluate the future scope in the ornamental fish trade and the current practices so in this my lecture we will go for the these three main points that is the objectives so present data of ornamental fish farming trade in the world what is the world scenario so among the top 10 imp importing countries usa was the single largest importer of ornamental fish with, with the import value of us dollar 56.57 million contributing nearly 19.7% of the total import in 2016 and now it is nearly 23% of the total import in 2019 the uk occupies the second position with with imports with us dollar 23.02 million followed by germany us dollar 18.61 million then japan us dollar 15.98 million netherlands us dollar 14.83 million singapore us dollar 13.58 million china that is 12.62 million as us dollar 12.52 million hong kong 10.70 million italy 9.06 million these 10 countries together shared over 83% of the total imports of the ornamental fish throughout the world so these are the uh, graphical presentation of the uh, earning of the uh, foreign money by ex by importing ornamental fishes in their uh, countries and they also export ornamental fish in different countries of the world so ornamental fish export in asia basis that is in 2012 data uh, that is hong kong hong kong here is the uh, 3% china 3% vietnam 1% philippines Four uh, percent, Sri Lanka five percent, Thailand fifteen percent, Malaysia eleven percent, Indonesia ten percent, Japan seventeen percent, Singapore thirty one percent. So out of these Asian countries, most of the countries that is the Singapore is the highest, that is the thirty one percent export of the ornamental fish, followed by um, uh, 
followed by followed by japan that is the uh, 17% then thailand 15% then indonesia then malaysia 11% then indonesia 10% then sri lanka 5% philippines 4% hong kong 3% china 3% Vietnam in one percent and India also now nearly one point that is point nine percent and is uh, it is uh, reaching to one percent. So this is the global uh, global ex exports of ornamental fish in two thousand uh, two thousand to two thousand fourteen US uh, dollar and these are the graphical presentations of uh, global exports of the ornamental fish. Then presentators of ornamental fish farming and trade in India. What is the position in India? About 80% of the ornamental fishes are from the fresh water and the rest from the brackish and the marine water. That is, lion's share of the ornamental fishes we get from the fresh water, that is from the rivers, from the lakes, from the large water bodies, from the canals, and uh, that is from the uh, sweet water, uh, what, uh, sweet, sweet water uh, systems and rest 20% uh, from the brackish water and from the marine water. So, in contrast to the freshwater ornamental fishes, marine ornamental fishes are the most popular worldwide due to their adaptability to live in the con confinement. And because the marine ornamental fishes are most attractive due to their color and due to their shape. India is blessed with rich diversity of freshwater fishes both in the northeastern hills and the western ghat because most of the indigenous ornamental fishes as per report are available uh, from the northeastern hills and the western ghat among the 300 species of freshwater fishes in the western ghat 155 that is 155 are considered ornamental of which 117 are endemic to the Western Ghats. The fish fauna of the Western Ghats include varieties of barbs, rasporas, eelfishes, glassfishes, catfishes, catproa, hill trots, and venues, which are the suitable candidates for the ornamental fish spread. In India, among the freshwater ornamental fish, 98% are colored and 2% 2 captured wild. That is, 98% we get from the cultural practices and 2% we get from the wild. The rest of the 2% of the total ornamental fish trade are from the marine fish, of which 98% are captured, that is, we catch from the wild and 2% from the culture stock. We culture in the marine uh, environment. The share of the India in world ornamental fish exports fluctuated and remained less than 1% for the most of the years. India's share in the world market ranged from 0.12% to 1.16% during 91 to 2009. And India gained highest market share of 1.16% during the year 2007. In 2008, it had a share of 0.64%, which again declined to 0.33% in 2015. And at present, only it is ranging from 0.8 to 0.9% in 2020. The major destination for export of the ornamental fishes from India is Singapore, because Singapore is called the capital of ornamental fish trade, where uh, the biggest market of the world for ornamental fish trade is situated at Singapore, and followed by Japan, USA, Malaysia, and Germany. Singapore, USA, Hong Kong, Malaysia, and Japan were India's favorite top five market destinations during 2003 to 9. And at present also the Hong Kong and uh, other 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 some Korean uh, countries are also added in this uh, 
process we jointly accounted for the about 70% of the total export of ornamental fishes from india because 70% of the ornamental fishes export to these countries especially these five to seven countries in the world so ornamental fish culture in west bengal that from the india we came to that is west bengal in our state the demand of ornamental fishes is increasing remarkably due to their important role in the world trade for fish and fishery productions about 288 exotic varieties of the ornamental fishes are popular in west bengal 288 exotic varieties are popular in west bengal due to congenial climatic conditions kolkata and its surrounding districts have emerged as the promising breeding centers for ornamental fish where a considerable number of small fish farmers and emeritus are engaged in this trade so many fish farmers are now very much interested for culture and trade of ornamental fish because their export value is more than that of other fishes prospect of ornamental fishes fish industry so ornamental fish culture is an excellent business opportunity in india since there is a strong demand among domestic and exotic market good good potential due to enormous geographical spread extensive species diversity at present export of live wild tropical fish is the only need among the top ornamental fish production countries the natural resources that is andaman nicobar gulf of menar park pe gulf kach and the lakhadik island which are very potential areas for the trade and production of ornamental fish apu बापू आई बापू स्लाइड इज नॉट चेंजिंग आई एम ट्राइंग लाइक टू गेट सम बस दैट आई एम रेच अरे ठीक है Then, uh, uh, what are the strategies we have to we have to take for the improvement of the ornamental fish industry in India? Even though India has vast ornamental fish resources in freshwater and marine sector, but the industry is not yet organized due to which contribution of the global trade is insignificant. With proper utilization of these resources. export earning of the industry of the country can be increased to many fold to improve the ornamental fish industry in india the following important strategies are to be recommended that is the systematic studies on the different aspect of breeding and reproductive biology of indigenous ornamental fishes then commercial farms with necessary infrastructural facilities and due support by the technical experts are the necessary to be set up for the mass production of these fishes culture breeding and marketing of indigenous ornamental plants should be given due emphasis ornamental fish breeding and rearing unit should be constant supply of good source of water and electricity farms with small scale production capacities need to be provided with necessary support for enhancing their output boarders chosen should be a superior quality to obtain healthy and high quality offspring having good demand in domestic as well as international market 
regular supply of seed ingredients like oil cakes, rice polish, and wheat bran, and animal based protein such as fish meal and the prawn head meal should be available for preparation of the pelleted feed for ornamental fishes. Also, live, live feed also available in for the ornamental fishes. That should be also the, their cultural practice should be increased. Application of the probiotics, which helps to well-being of the host animal and contribute directly or indirectly to the to protect the host animal against harmful bacteria and pathogens. So application of probiotics has to be increased in the, the culture trade of ornamental fishes so that their colorations and their disease resistance should be more so that they can live for a long time. Incorporation of pigment rich locally available ingredients to diet to impart the desired coloration of the colored ornamental fish to increase the market price because the market rate depends on the coloration and lucrative color lucrative uh, nature and their shape of the body that that brings the rate in the market of the ornamental fishes Improvement of the transportation facilities to supply the ornamental fish into domestic and international market with the minimum trace of the live fish. Complete knowledge on the market demand, customer preference, and the process of a marketing network through personal contact and public relations is very much essential to enhance the trade. People involved in breeding an export should always be kept in touch with the recent developments in breeding, rearing, marketing, as well as research advancement in the field of ornamental fishes. Ornamental fish farmers are necessary. Ornamental fish farms are necessary to be equipped with fish pathology laboratory with the basic facility to overcome disease outbreak in the systems because if we do not go for me uh, measuring the disease control laboratory, then the ornamental fish culture is very difficult. If there is infection in the fish, all the fishes will die within very short period. So establishment of health centers for the quarantine certification at key locations to meet the desired standards for the importer is essential. Because when I go for uh, import the ornamental fishes, then there is a certification is needed that that fishes are healthy and they are disease free. Otherwise, we cannot export in foreign countries. Frequent organizations of the training on different aspects of, of aquarium management by the research, resourceful in the, in, industries for the short and long duration, depending on the parental groups and requirement are necessary to boost the ornamental sectors because training is also necessary day to day update knowledge should be uh, shared to the uh, farmers so that they can adopt the new technology for the culture and trade of the ornamental fish mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, last, last of all, I, uh, I go for a conclusion that the trade of <coughs> the trade opportunities of ornamental fishes from India have been organized by the producers, collectors, and the traders, both nationally and internationally. Business opportunities in ornamental fish farming can be realized by the production, marketing, and wild catch of the ornamental fishes. Even though India is one of the global hotspots of the ornamental fish biodiversity, but its ornamental fish state is based mostly on wild collection. To conserve these species and to get economic benefits on sustainable manner, development and due attention is required. There is ample scope of, of to develop 
entrepreneurship on the indigenous fish and plant species having ornamental value because there are some plants they, they are also having ornamental views so the cultivation of the different type of attractive plant species is required for the safety of the ornamental fishes because these plants are given in the aquarium for their oxygen and carbon dioxide absorption apart from the ornamental fish there is a scope for the development of the industry on light food and the artificial feed of aquarium accessories required for the ornamental fish keeping more intensified research and development in both fresh and marine water fishes can lead to the development of the culture technologies for many species of demand in aquarium trade in the globe there is no proper policy for the development of ornamental fish industry in india especially in the export trade at present at present at present more initiative initiatives by the government like providing incentive to the to establish the ornamental fish production units considerable private investment can be attracted to this industry which would generate additional employment opportunities and improvement of the livelihood of the community because most of the youth who are still unemployed in the village area they can be they can be given advance training for ornamental fish culture and trade so that they can earn their livelihood by this practice as part of the poverty alleviation measures the government of india launched the swarna jayanti gram swarajkar yojana in 1999 where the major emphasis is on the self help group formation social mobilizations and the economic activations through the micro credit finance which also help to start up an ornamental fish culture practices public private entrepreneurship can be encouraged through establishment of ornamental fish production units in different parts of the region to make this sector more vibrant and remunerative for employment generation and livelihood improvement improvement so these are the reference for making this lecture and i think this ornamental fish trade and culture uh, is very important So these are the my, my lecture the ornamental fish trade and everything uh, so thank you to you all for listening this short lecture because time is very short so many speakers are here uh, to give their valuable lecture so thank you to you all for having patience to listen my lecture again i uh, convey my best regards to the organizers of the of chagda college both from the department of geology and geography who invited me uh, to give the lecture on the topic thank you to you all. sir please unmute uh, iftika sir please unmute your mic thank you professor ashish kumar panigrai sir for your informative talk on to scope to increase production of ornamental fish varieties and challenges the importance of successful entrepreneurship in ornamental fish trade thank you sir now uh, i would like to request dr priyal gosuroy to deliver his valuable speech dr priyal gosuroy is professor in geography of kochbihar panchanan parma university west bengal and also former registrar at the kochbihar panchanan parma university he has done his phd from vishwabharati university he is also the president of geographical society of west bengal alipurdwar west bengal besides teaching presently he is actively engaged in various research works 
He has many national and international publications. Over to Dr. Piyal Bhushuroi. Thank you very much, Dr. Nishikaralam. Is it audible to everybody? Yes, yes, audible, sir. Okay, thank you. I would like to give uh, my uh, deep and sincere thanks to everybody who have nicely organized international webinar. Hope uh, it will be a uh, grand success. Uh, and uh, since the time is very short, I I will go direct to the presentation. Is the presentation visible, Dr. Iptika? Yes, yes. Presentation is visible. Visible. Sir, actually your slides are not visible, on screen are visible. Just uh, share the slides. Mm, I have already shared. Just again, stop share and then again uh, share that slides. Uh, slides are not visible. Open your PPT and then share it. Yes, it is now visible. Is it visible now? Yes, yes. No. Previously it was visible, but uh, now it is only screen. You have to put the slides in front of this. Yes, yes. You have, okay, yes, now yes. it is visible. Oh. Okay. Now you can okay. present it at once. You see, the topic of discussion is land use, land cover change, and its impact on biodiversity loss in Dwarf, West Bengal, India. You know very well uh, about the two terms, particularly for the geographers, very well known term, land use and land cover change. For all, all of us, it is very uh, visible to biodiversity loss. At first, I would like to uh, Clarify the term land use and land cover. Ah, yes, okay. You see what is land use and land cover? You see, land cover is basically the existing physical characteristics of earth surface. That means vegetation, soil, what we are observing uh, in our surroundings. And that no human interference. That means people do not utilize that land is that that is land cover and whenever there is human interference on that land particularly for the purpose of utilization for any any kind of objectives that is called as land use we are using the land for a particular object for a particular purpose then then uh, land cover is is, is to, to some extent natural and land use to some extent due to human intervention is artificial in a uh, term. Now you see how what is land use and land cover. You see, whenever land cover we, we discuss about land cover, then automatically land use comes. Okay. Because the land cover is as it is a natural cover, huh? and people do to, uh, to is it audible, na? Huh? Hello. Yes, yes, yes. And you see, you see, uh, basically, as I uh, stated earlier, that land cover is a natural setting, and whatever people 
use that particular land then that is termed as land use okay and due to we are more much more we are being uh, we have growing demand we have uh, we are becoming consumeristic more so we we have a tendency to change the land cover that means natural setting for our own use then uh, this is termed as land use okay so land use is a term uh, which is particularly artificial uh, human interaction or invention or human uh, interference now you see <clears throat> since i have discussed about how uh, land use how do land use and land cover changes uh, make uh, uh, biodiversity loss particularly in the dwarf area you know very well about dwarf area dwarf area is particularly located in the northern part of west bengal particularly in the jalpaiguri and alipurdwar district you know and uh, you know very well about why it has been as doers it is the 18 passages by which you can go to uh, the hills of bhutan or you can enter through bhutan that means these are considered as door so that is uh, is it is uh, no doers ah. now see in alipurdwar and jalpaiguri district of west bengal particularly doers is located the total area of of this uh, uh dwarf area is 880 km uh, there are also dwarf area in assam hmm. in in uh, darjeeling also few lower part of uh, darjeeling sheiguri uh, east of chiliguri ha uh, so actually uh, river is it is theory is it goes by the river to the coast to divide it the dwarfs into two part eastern part and western part and eastern part is known as assam dwarfs whereas western dwarfs is bengal dwarfs that means the dwarfs uh, is located in west bengal ha huh. now you see the what we have uh, the total diversity of dwarfs see their elevation <laughs> level uh, uh, is below 1000 meter and that is 1000 meter to 2500 meter and another is 2500 meter to 4000 meter and since there is elevation differences there is also differences in the species of flora particularly shawl uh, that means oria vasati uh, in bengali term is called as shegun people shishu bamboo etc as soon as you move from lower level to the higher level in terms you will get uh, oak alder magnolia birch this type of above 2000 meter you you will get uh, there, uh, pine forest there pine forest cedar uh, although the number are very few so these are the basic of floral diversity of dwarfs now have a look the faunal diversity ha huh. again uh, for the convenient of uh, for the convenience of the study the dwarfs may be classified into two tracks one is lower hill area and the upper hill area and you see in the uh, lower hill area leopard deer uh, sambar hog rhinos etc are found whereas in the upper hill area wild dog wolf bear etc are the major animals is it is it audible yes sir it is audible you can Hello? continue the okay. voice is not very clear okay. but it is now audible okay it okay. is now audible now okay now you see the uh, there are i i i go just to see uh, floral diversity there are three layer layer of altitude so 1000 meter from 1000 meter 
2000 meter and then 2500 to 4000 meter and all schedule to am to 1000 meter level whereas nolia barch all the number are on the 1500 meter and coniferous forest although fewer in number particularly pine par cedar juniper etc trees these are rodent on also various rodent uh, uh, are here uh, 2000 highlighted to to 4000 meter there your voice is not clear bigana nando please stop your presenting bigana nando please stop your presenting now it is audible and now you are audible sir but hello 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 okay okay so you see there are different type of trees dr priyal bosurai please share the ppt again dr priyal bosurai please share the ppt again if i will share again or is it visible no 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 is it visible no please uh, no not sir no sir and it is stable at one corner okay okay now now you see for the university of birds Have no, you noticed for our university government? It is not visible. Okay, then I am again sharing. Okay. Ah, uh, please again share. And come to the uh, slide, present slide. disturbing cause due to someone present you see you see now it yes is, coming it is coming it is, it is coming this uh, network problem is here yeah, since few days huh? yes visible Yes, but uh, but uh, but slide is not visible. Presenting is there. Slide is not visible. No, no. Just a minute. now no sir sir you can continue but you can continue, uh, you, you can continue now you have ppt okay okay, okay, okay. Yeah. without ppt okay, you can okay. continue okay 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 now actually uh, there are there are so many causes of land use land cover change huh? so the cause are hard reforestation climbers slow fire wild animals insects and fungi huh? is a flood diversion cyclone fire oil insect and food men is made for that their grazing hunting pollution habitat etc see this, there is continuously built up in this region which which has been affecting the area and and uh, the existing uh, diversity Uh, of the area is is gradually reducing in number
sorry due to some technical problem uh, iptika sir we can call, uh, call the next speaker or okay you can call the next speaker okay thank you thank you so much uh, dr p alwa shuroy for your informative talk on land use change and its impact on biodiversity now i, like, I would like to request dr raju hr aduri to deliver its valuable speech dr aduri is currently working as senior research associate in department of cellular and molecular biology of the university of texas health science center united states he has completed his phd from center of dna fingerprinting and diagnostic hyderabad telangana His research area mainly focuses in genomics which is applicable to the technologies related to biodiversity. He has many national and international publications in different renowned journals. Over to Dr. Aduri. Can you see my screen? Yes, sir. It is visible. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so I am audible too, right? Yes, you are audible. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, in committee, for inviting me, and uh, I'm very happy to uh, talk on this platform. And uh, good morning, good evening to all. Uh, I am Adhuri, Dr. Adhuri, and uh, my uh, topic today is human microbiome in health and disease. Bioconservation. Generally, we know about the eukaryote, the visible organisms, the higher order organisms, because we see them, we can count them, and then we we know where they are. They food habits niche and how their environment and or uh, the ecosystem gets endangered but it is not as straight forward it is for microorganisms because we don't know the extent of microorganisms present in the ecosystems there are no effective tools for understanding their organizational structure so thanks to recent technological advancements now we started understanding more about microbial ecosystems so this talk is about understanding how microbiome uh, micro microbiome ecosystems exist and how we understand their composition and how they benefit us and what we have been doing in the recent past to understand the human and microbial interactions at a larger scale uh, in the real time I want to move to the next slide but it's taking time you can you can uh, read uh, uh, okay okay it is coming yeah yes yes so this is called tree of life scientists say so here is the lower organisms on the left left side of the screen that is archaea and bacteria those are called prokaryotes and as we go towards right those are eukaryotes and then see uh, here the homo sapiens that means humans 
we are here in the organization structure of life so we know more about the eukaryotes and we know their ecosystems and we understand their diversity and then in the last 400 years the biodiversity preservation conservation has uh, become a topic of concern and then the governments are actively doing that but what we don't know about is how our life and the loof uh, the life of larger eukaryotes is dependent on the distribution of the eukaryotes which are on the left side because this is largely because we don't know how to study them because we don't have the technical expertise before 20 years ago or even if the techniques are present they can't do they can't help in understanding the entire ecosystem we can study an individual bacteria we can study an individual virus but we don't know in a drop of water how many microorganisms are present and what is their distribution so in the last 20 years we have developed the techniques to study that and here is uh, on the left side what you are seeing is the person is collecting a water sample from environment a small sea shore and if we see the water droplet and the microscope you see on the left side the black dots so this many are the number of microorganisms we see on the microscope but seeing under microscope will not reveal what that organism is we need to be able to culture them and look at its morphology look at its genotypes look at its size shape and many other factors to understand what microbe what microbe it is so for example microbe e coli is like a rod shape and it has uh, certain uh, Uh, outer structures and its cell wall is of certain composition so to understand that we need to be able to culture the organisms and if we look at all the microorganisms present in this world by sampling if we study them what we understood in the last 4 5 years is a significantly very small proportion of the all microorganisms we can culture but a vast majority of microorganisms cannot be cultured so we can't study them in depth so see the cartoon on the right side so this is on the world map and you know the pink the bottom portion is a cultivable genera of species and the other top portions two portions are cannot be cultured so it is a very minority of the micro microorganisms we ever know and there is a skewness here skewness means seeing the data in a very a, a very specific angle so if we see all microorganisms we can culture they are always directly or indirectly related to human life that means over years when we started culturing and progressing with optimizing cultures what we have done as humans is that we started culturing organisms which are related to us directly or indirectly so we started ignoring any microorganism which is not directly related to us or indirectly related to us but we don't know how those organisms affect our life so now in this last two decades scientists have put lot of effort in understanding those uh microorganisms and this is a historical perspective of understanding the microbial populations in the ecosystems and if you see on the left 1676 the year is where leuwenhoek reported observation of 
microorganisms. And it took more than 200 years to culture the first microorganism. It was done by the scientist Robert Koch. And when Koch cultured microorganisms, it is a single microorganism at a time. And you know what is an ecosystem? Ecosystem is like in a uh, certain area, all living organisms live together and share the resources. And there is an interaction between two different organisms in an interact in, in an ecosystem. And in 1931, almost 50 years after that, Win, Wingratsky reported that the microorganisms are in a very specific ecosystem. And it took another 50 years close to, to understand that microorganisms can be classified or the relationship or uh, the closeness between two different microorganisms can be studied using rRNA as a marker. And at the same time, Frederick Sanger invented DNA sequencing. DNA sequencing means understanding the sequence of the basis in the DNA. And the DNA sequencing became much more powerful when Kerry Mullis. Yes. Hello? So, sorry, you can continue. No, no, yeah. sorry. Go ahead. Continue. So in 1980s, Carrie Mullis developed a PCR that, that gave a lot of uh, wider opportunity to increase the throughput of sequencing. And in 1990s, Giovanni first described the 16S rRNA libraries. That means he used the 16S rRNA to identify microbial communities in an ecosystem. And the term metagenomics was proposed in 1998. That is just 20 years ago. And what is metagenomics? It is direct genetic analysis of genomes contained within a whole community. As I said earlier, in a community, if we take a sample from the community and start culturing, we, cal we could be able to culture maybe 2 to 5% of the microorganisms present. But if we do genomic analysis, it circumvents the need for doing a culture. So in genomic analysis, we will not miss many of the microorganisms we miss when we do culturing. And the sequencing technologies have improved over time. And now we are doing a next generation sequencing. And then if we compare, if we start from 1998 to 2015, on the, which is on the right side. So there is a lot of improvement in sequencing technologies. Now, to understand microbial communities, the knob has been next generation sequencing. And because of next generation sequencing, we are able to know that what is the compositional structure of the eco microbial ecosystems. And even as humans, we have a lot of microorganisms present in our body. If you see the bottom of the slide, the child, he has a certain distribution of microorganisms in him. And as he grows older, the microorganismal composition will change over time and till the time of old age and death. And we now realize that this microorganism composition is very important for maintaining our health and then disturbance in this composition will cause diseases. So I was talking about RRNA being identified as a a tool for uh, distinguishing between microorganisms. R RRNA in prokaryotes is three times. It is 23S and 16S and 55S. And for bacterial metagenomics, we use 16S RRNA, which is 100 and 
1550 base pairs. And why we select RRNA? Because it is universally present in all microorganisms and it is active in all cellular functions and it is extremely conserved in sequence. For example, a certain species of microorganisms or always have the identical uh, uh, RRNA sequence. And to your right, this is the prokaryotic ribosome, the large subunit and small subunit. The large subunit is of five, contains 5S RRNA and the small subunit contains 23S RRNA. So, uh, the large subunit contains 5S and 23S RRNA and the smaller one has 16S RRNA. So we are concerned with the, the smaller subunit RRNA, which is 16S. And uh, so 16S RRNA can be used as a phylogenetic markers and then its size is very small compared to the, the larger RNAs. So it is very easy to analyze in a PCR uh, platform. So 1542 base pairs can be divided into two portions on uh, a Sanger sequencing protocol. So that gave a lot of opportunity for understanding the microbial structures. So here is a typical structure of uh, uh, 16S rRNA, and it has eight highly conserved regions, which are in uh, cyan color, and nine variable regions, which are in pink color. So what is to do with uh, uh, conservative, uh, conserved regions and variable regions. Conserved regions are always the same in the, uh, almost always similar across organisms. This is the variable regions, which are different from one species to another species. So our, the area of in interest here is the species, the the regions in the RRNA, which are different between different species, they are the markers for identifying certain species from the other one. So, and on the other hand, the conserved regions are very strictly identical in a certain phyla and they will also change, but they are only different between one type of one group of bacteria compared to other group of bacteria at a higher taxonomical range. So here is uh, the analysis of uh, 16S rRNA and its effectiveness in uh, distinguishing taxa. So here is the regions on the x-axis is the different regions of uh, uh, 16S rRNA. On the y-axis is their variation the extent of variation. If you see the V2, which is on the top, I marked V1, V2, V3, V4 on the top of the left side figure. And if you see V2, the peak is very high. That means among all the nine variable regions in 16S rRNA, the region V2 has a very high variability. That means V2 is a very good region for distinguishing between species. Likewise, if you see V4 or V7 and V8, their variability, though they are variable inherently, their variability in sequence is very limited compared to regions like V2 or V6. It shows that if, if we sequence the regions V2 and V6, like we are more likely to get uh, a pow uh, more uh, distinguishing power between species. On the right of your screen is uh, <clears throat> the ability to distinguish be between uh, species when we use the different uh, regions of 16S rRNA as marker. And see the first one where they used V1 and V2, that means variable regions V1 and V2, a very short fragment, the, <clears throat> they, could able, they could be able to distinguish di distinguish lot of species from one another very clearly. And on the right side, extreme right side on the top, the V1 to V9, if they use the entire region, 
they are able to distinguish between species very very effectively but technically it is not always possible to use the entire region so based based on this diagram what we can find out is using entire sequence of 16s rrna is a very good method and if not v1 and v2 and v6 v9 those are the better regions for understanding the variability in microorganism composition so i forgot to tell you the dark pink is the color that means less ability to distinguish between species so if you take v4 see the the phylogenetic tree is very dark that means we are not able to identify species properly we can only probably identify phyla or genus or family so so this is a i'll talk about uh, the workflow of uh, 16s rrna in high throughput sequencing that is that is what i call next generation sequencing so we take a sample and it can be a, a drop of water or uh, a drop of uh, a, a mg of soil or any other material and we extract dna from it and then we construct 16s rrna library and then we sequence those all libraries and analyze the data so here is the typical way of uh, analyzing uh, 16s rrna in the microbial communities and we take the library and deposit on a small chip it is just like a slide Uh, which we use for uh, uh, microbial examination or uh, in the laboratory under microscope so but the slide is uh, slightly different from the regular glass slide it is charged and then we call it a flow cell and then we do pcr re what is it no sensitivity ha Mahadev Das, please uh, mute yourself. Mahadev Das, please mute yourself. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, continue. Please yeah. continue. Okay. So uh, we amplify the DNA on the slide itself, what we call a flow cell, and then we come, we create a double stranded DNA, and we sequence these double stranded DNAs all at once on a single slide, and for the present day capacity to sequence is like around 4 billion sequences on a single glass slide glass slide so if you compare to the culture method so in a in a petri plate when we culture we see a single colony and then we isolate dna and study a single microorganism and with compared to it in the next generation sequencing we can study 1 billion microorganisms on a single slide at the same time so that is the advancement of technique in the recent past so as you can understand based on this that in the last 20 years our ability to study the microbial communities at very high resolution has developed enormously so with the advent of technology we started understanding microbial communities better sir please and, uh, please present present your slide again uh, please present and uh, participant don't uh, present uh, present button don't click the present button participants don't please please uh, don't click the present button sir Party, you will continue participant yeah. are actually requesting uh, requesting you not to press the present button please cooperate us with sir you can continue and present uh, again yeah. present the screen. yeah so are you able to see my screen now uh, no no raju sir you you have to present uh, again you have to press the present now button again okay yeah let me do it Okay, it is coming, sir. Yeah. Okay. Now it is visible. You can go to the present slide. Okay. Thank you, sir. 
Yeah. So, were you able to see this slide last time? Yes, 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 sir. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yes. So, with improvement in technology, so we started understanding the microbial communities better, and it is a very humongous effort from the U.S. government and Massachusetts Institute of Technology in USA, Boston, and they started sampling marine water across the globe. So here is the world map, and then they collected water samples from all oceans on the in the world at different time points and at different geographical locations. This is the first effort to understand what are the microorganisms present in seawater, and what they found is that on the right side you see. Uh, there are many types of microorganisms present in the uh, marine water and it changes over time too. And the microorganisms present in one place is not exactly same as the other place. So for, if you see uh, this delta proteobacteria, so they are more compared to other places in this uh, the blue areas where 132, 133, and 137 on the left side on your world map. So, which means the microorganismal composition of water ecosystems, even though they are all oceans, they are not different. They are not same. They are different based on space and time. And here, this is the slide shows how different they are in the north and southern hemisphere. And so near the equator, the dots are more maroon in color and the species richness is increasing if while, when we keep moving towards tropic, that tropics, that means if we keep going towards poles, North Pole and South Pole, there are very diverse number of bacteria in the so in the uh, marine water compared to the uh, equator equatorial region and so for every uh, thousand kilometer uh, uh, area so uh, the di uh, the dissimilarity of the micro microorganismal changes will keep increasing. So he, here on the right, you can see that the dissimilarity of the microorganisms will keep changing over certain distance in the ocean, which tells that even though it is a oceanic water, the microbial distribution in the ocean is not always same. It varies based on distance. And it varies based on temperature. It varies based on the geographical location, uh, whether it is close to equator or whether it is uh, close to north and south poles. And why do we have to study microbiome? So understanding ecosystems is one thing, but the e ecosystems I was talking about is a marine water in, in a far... Uh, uh, space uh, far distance from uh, human civilization may not have a direct influence on human systems. But the thing is, we are surrounded by a lot of microorganisms. And the humans have microorganisms throughout the human body. Likewise, the organisms we depend on, for example, plants and the cattle or other animals where we use for food or we use for agricultural purpose or any other way. So all these microorganisms have, should have a very healthy composition of, sorry, all these uh, animals and plants, including humans, should have a very healthy composition of microorganismal structure that is needed for optimum health and high fitness and the growth and productivity and fertility. So if there is a perturbation of these microorganism structure, which means 
depletion of certain microorganisms from the body or they uh, proportion being changed or the, if the diversity is increased then that causes diseases so for example we are sir, please on, please summarize your presentation please the yeah. time short is sir yeah sure so so this is a various stages over time uh, our microorganism uh, composition changes and here is the uh, microorganism composition of the human body the hair nostrils and skin we see a lot of actinobacteria and in the internal organs we see a lot of permicutes and if there is a disturbance in these microorganism structure we get diseases and now in this time we are hunting for the healthy human microbiome because our lifestyle has changed from a primitive hunter gatherers to a urbanized uh, person who eats a processed food so the microorganism structure what we have now is not actually what we generally have because our lifestyle has changed and we are more westernized and so here is one in uh, massachusetts institute of technology so uh, where uh, we have been uh, doing studies on understanding the natural human microbiome and people are reaching out to the tribes where there is no uh, westernization so that their food is very natural so they are very healthy compared to the western population or the uh, more urbanized population so we are now understand uh, studying the natural microbiome of humans so that in future we can tackle a lot of diseases and this is how we are using the, the microbiome uh, in the personalized medicine too so we know that we get some diseases based on uh, our hereditary and the metabolic and proteomic changes in our body but now the doctors are adding another parameter to it the microbiome and based on the microbiome structure the persons will be assigned to go for a treatment a or b c based on all these things so that means if this the person has a same disease but based on his microbiome he will be better for undergoing treatment a over b and it is just like a human thumbprint each person has a single thumbprint which is not matching to another one likewise humans have also have a microbiome just like a signature and this is what uh, the recent study in science magazine shows and what they did is that they took diseased population and then they categorized them based on uh, whether the drug worked for the patient and is there side effects too so here are the four groups where toxicity means side effects and beneficial means whether the disease cured or not so there are four groups based on these two parameters and they check what is their microbial structure they are very different and what they did later is that they took uh, cancer patients who are responding to therapy and cancer patients who did not respond to therapy and then they changed the intestine fecal material they collected the fecal material from those patients and transplanted into mouse and injected the tumor into mouse and they see that the the mouse which is receiving microbiome from the non responder also not did, did not respond to the therapy whereas mouse which re, which received the microbiome from a healthy human sorry uh, cancer patient who responded to the therapy also responded to the therapy it emphasizes the need for understanding the microbiome of humans and it also tells that human microbiome will affect the human health in more ways than we generally perceive and i conclude and uh, in the last 20 years we started understanding microbiome much better because of technological advancement and 
So even then, majority of the microbiome has not been characterized, and this microbiome changes between disease and status. And the, the humongous efforts in understanding the natural microbiome and the microbial composition of individuals may determine the health and disease status and response to. Yeah, thank you for patience. Uh, I'm sorry, you. we took a little more time than what is assigned. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Raju Eshar Aduri, for your informative and knowledgeable talk on human microbiome in health and disease. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Piyal Bosura informed me that there is a heavy rainfall in Kosbiar, so there is a network problem. Sorry for the inconvenience. Dear participant, there will be a question answer session. Please shoot your question with the name of the speaker being asked in the chat box. Please shoot your question in the chat box. Now, I would like to request Dr. Somnath Mukherjee to deliver his valuable speech. Dr. Somnath Mukherjee is an assistant professor in geography of Bakura Christian College, West Bengal. He has done his PhD from Vishto Bharati University. He has specialization in remote sensing and image interpretation, anthropo anthropogeography, and tribal social ecology. He was awarded Young Geographer Award from Pondatuko University in Regional Science International Conference 2013. He also positioned second under Art Science Section in Regional Science and Technology Congress organized by Department of Science and Technology, Government of West Bengal. Over to Dr. Sumnath Mukherjee. Uh, can you please uh, tell me uh, that my slide is visible or not? Yes, yes, visible and audible. We are audible and okay. Okay, the time is very short, uh, so I directly uh, jump into the, my topic. Uh, now, uh, now in the consideration of uh, the main topic of uh, this international level webinar. I must admit that uh, for the sustenance of the biodiversity and human civilization itself, we should keep in mind the fundamental relationship between environment and man. Uh, to convey my sincere thanks to all the staff members, especially Honorable Principal Madam, Professor Swagata Das Mohata, and Dr. Riptikar Alam, Head of the Department of Geography, Chabdoho College, for giving me the opportunity to share my thoughts with all of you. Uh, now, uh, we know that uh, we live in the Holocene, but due to the large effect of the human in almost every sphere of the earth, I must consider the name of the Paul Crutchen, who coined the term Anthropocene and explain that stop using the word Holocene. We are not in the Holocene anymore. We are in the age of Anthropocene. This statement is nothing but the ignorance of the relationship between the mother nature and human. He was so anxious and fascinating about that, that he published this view in Nature Journal entitled Geology of Mankind. And I uh, convey my suggestion to all the participants to, to please uh, visit this uh, uh, website of this and uh, please visit all this uh, uh, publication of him. Now, what should we call the relationship? Man in environment? Or we should respect the situation and call it an environment human nature mixer or simply the environment and human interrelationship as also put forwarded by 1992. Just a flip of the two terms can easily justify the relationship and their existence. The study of the association between these two elements nowadays becomes so important in relation to the both. 
particularly for the existence of human civilization. Now, I would like to take this opportunity to discuss the interrelationship with broad spectrum of higher level elements uh, of image interpretation and these are sight and association. Uh, being a geographer and also as a geologist, we also would like to know about uh, the fundamental aspects of remote sensing and GIS. And in remote sensing and GIS, image interpretation as an interpreter is a very much important uh, for the benefit of the uh, total society. Now, interpretation of remote and satellite imagery can be done by so many key elements of it, such as primary element, tone, color, or hue. Likewise, sight and association being a higher level elements of image interpretation can judge the structural assets of geography and allied disciplines. Sight is nothing but the answer of the fundamental question of geography, and that is where is it? In GIS environment, uh, we often use the term AOI, that means area of interest, which is nothing but the geographical space, the site under observation or study. Now, association, on the other hand, can be observed by the proximity of different geoclimatic condition and spatial and cultural differences. I would like to put before you some examples of sites and association by the definition of geography. As we all know, the, the Greek exponents, Eratosthenes, coined the term geography and defined the term as geography is the study of the art as a whole. Where art or a part of it is the site and home or habitat can be analyzed, can be explained in terms of the character of the heterogeneous world or heterogeneous space. Now, to simplify these terms, sites and association, I take an example of a fair. Usually a fair is organized in the heart of the town so that people could easily reach to the site for their amusement. Now, how we can differentiate a fair with a market? Generally, a big fair has certain features and associations like a Ferris wheel, like you see that this is the Ferris wheel by which we could easily identify that it is a fair. This is an, another example of the interrelationship which can be viewed by sites and association. Here, the age old city of Varanasi is the site and the association is the Holy River Ganges. Now, as a researcher, we should peep into the details of the relationship and need to develop a research mind to find out the problems first. We are familiar with the first picture where Varanasi is what we generally perceive. But do we perceive uh, in a different way, like uh, the adjacent picture? The association of a river in, in a rainy season, like uh, this season, naturally occurs some sort of inundation. So being a researcher, we should keep our research mind open for finding out the problem of the research. Now, this is an, another example where we all know, due to the Anthropocene effect, such uh, as, uh, as put forwarded by you know that, Earlier, as I mentioned earlier, and modern cities uh, are more and more situated uh, with close association of the vulnerable sites like seacoast. And we saw what happened to the Sendai city. This is the picture. If you see the Sendai city of the northern Japan after a havoc tsunami occurred due to the earthquake of around nine magnitude in 2011. And I must uh, admit that, that both the uh, aspects uh, like sites and association are time dependent. How it is? Now, with the help of this uh, satellite image of 15th, uh, 25th October 1996 of coastal Andhra Pradesh, we can see a normal situation of both the place, means uh, this is the 
this is the Bay of Bengal region and this is the coastal regions. So this is a normal condition. But due to the cyclonic disturbances, uh, the whole site affected, uh, which we can see uh, from the satellite image of 9th November 1996, which shows the devastation and change. So with this, uh, we can say that both the site and association are time dependent. Now, yes, uh, uh, as we all know that uh, there are different viewpoints and school of thoughts in relation to environment, human nature nexus. We know that uh, in environmental determinism, uh, where the environment actually controls the human actions and uh, draws the limitations. Whereas if you take a look at this one, that is technological materialism, where uh, in this modern era of Anthropocene, as proposed by Paul Crutchen, technology by itself vividly, loudly, and silently uh, also destroys both the environment and human society. Now, let me introduce another aspect to deal with the interrelationship, and that is social ecology. In my first attempt, I'd like to disclose the interrelationship between the tribal communities and the surrounding ecology of the extended eastern part of the Chotnagpur Plateau. In this case study, I have selected Purulia district as a site, which is the Aboriginal root of so many tribal communities situated in West Bengal, India. Now, uh, the first attempt on, and the first question arises in a geography, geography uh, or the geographer's mind that where is it? That means the location. And that means the where the tribal people are mainly inhabited in this district. If you consider tribe as a main, as a man of jungle, then uh, they are the man of jungle. Here with the help of uh, the elevation and the, this is the elevation map and the, this is the forest map. Uh, it is observed that the, the deep forested uh, uh, uplands, the western elevated zones, uh, and the undulating tract of the southern part, which is also covered with black green vegetation, are the favorable sites and location of the tribal communities of this part of the world. Now, uh, with the help of this digital elevation model, the sites uh, of the original habitat of the indigenous people will be further and better understood. This is the elevated zones of Ajitda Hilly regions. And this is the undulating tract of the Bandwan regions uh, uh, and uh, surmise that uh, still they prefer to live in isolation. Now, uh, it is evident that uh, the analysis of any human civilization cannot be possible without the surrounding nature and its available components. This is uh, an, actually a figure that, uh, uh, that further consolidated by the view of Ramachandra Guha, where he surmised and accepted the importance of uh, analysis of environment to delineate the boundary of the human society, where he said that social facts can only be properly understood with reference to the natural environment within which the humans, like any other species, live, survive, and reproduce. Now, uh, these are the pictures uh, I have taken during my field visits. Uh, this is the Ajodha hilly regions, uh, the extended part of the Chotnagpur Plateau. These pictures depict that the ecological barriers tend to influence the patterns of human settlement. If you see that uh, due to these ecological barriers, even the tribes has, is having the scattered settlement. Now, uh, when I have come down to relatively plain land, uh, what I have discovered that uh, they, uh, they are actually living in the compact and the linear settlement. So we can say that the nature of the sites offers some conditions, some barriers. And here the tribal people pay their respect to their nature and associated with the nature with sustainable thinking and actions. But uh, if you take a look at this uh, picture, what I actually shown to you that uh, uh, the, the modern people actually living in these uh, close proximity to a particular association of these vulnerable sites and what happened to them. So we must consider the tribal way of life that is the traditional life and we must respect the environment. 
Now, uh, I take an example of uh, impact of association of naturally occurred saline blanks on the growth of swampy vegetation, the mangrove forest of Indian part of Sundarban. Uh, now, here in this uh, case study, I have uh, selected uh, three islands of Indian Sundarbans, and uh, these are Lothian, South Surendranagar, and uh, this is Lothian, South Surendranagar, and Zonji, which are situated just uh, alongside with the famous Sagar Islands. Now, uh, in the GIS environment, I prepared this uh, land cover map of 1986. Uh, with the help of this line, uh, land uh, cover map of 1986, we can see that uh, there were a patch uh, detected uh, in the central part of the Lothian Island, situated in the west of these islands. With the help of image interpretation and ground truth, it is revealed that this pinkish uh, patch, this is the pinkish patch, you know, that uh, is nothing but the saline blanks. Now, uh, uh, for a, a non-geographer, it is very difficult to understand the saline blanks, but uh, uh, as a geographer, when I, uh, when I visited there, I found that uh, these saline blanks actually by naturally depleted the mangrove forest. These saline blanks are gradually developing the low-lying areas of these islands due to the concentration of high salinity prone tidal water of the adjacent Bay of Bengal during high tides. Typically and naturally and silently, the whole place becomes saline, uh, so saline that even the mangroves cannot be survived in this uh, inhospitable condition. Thus, uh, here the mangrove naturally depleted due to the association of the saline blanks. Uh, and there is another reason behind such uh, cause. And uh, what I have discovered that, uh, that we all know that uh, uh, this is the Indian part of Sundarban, but the Sundarban is also uh, in the Bangladeshi part too. Uh, what I have discovered that the adjacent Bangladeshi part of Sundarban, the cases of occurrence of such saline blanks is very, very limited due to the relatively low salinity level in the adjacent sea water. Uh, geologically, due to the Great Eastern tilt, this part of India is slightly tilted towards east, and due to this, most of the sweet waters of the rivers are flowing towards farthest east, that means towards Bangladesh. And that is why the salinity of the water of Bay of Bengal adjacent to the Indian part of Sundarban, this is the Indian part of Sundarban, uh, the adjacent sea water, is about two parts per million more saline than the water adjacent to the Bangladeshi part of Sundarban. So the association is uh, very much important uh, for the analysis of the, uh, uh, and, and its impact on the uh, particular uh, sites. Now, uh, you can see the same sites uh, became affected uh, all over the places uh, in uh, the adjacent islands of, uh, of the Lothian. So this is the Dhonchi Islands, and this is the picture of 2000, uh, this is the map of 2014. Thus, being a researcher, there are ample evidences from which we can draw the environment-human interrelationship with the help of uh, the higher level elements of image interpretation. Now, with the help of, uh, now we can see that, uh, just a minute. Now, uh, this is the conclusion. Uh, can you see my uh, slides? Hello? Yes, it is coming. OK, OK. Just a minute. Now, in fine, uh, I must say that uh, the outrage of the materialistic development by the human plays a detrimental role towards uh, ecological breakdown. Uh, and the existence of both the environment and human. Being a geographer, I would like to address uh, the significance of the concept of Griffith Taylor's stop and go determinism. Uh, I, I believe that uh, the stop and go determinism of the Griffith Taylor's is also associated with the other allied disciplines of geography like geology, which taught us that man need to stop for awakening of the situation. It will be the state of the human action where we need to think about the environment, all biotic and abiotic elements of our mother nature. The relationship between a son and mother 
should always be reciprocal. Mother shouldn't always be in the giving end. Now the time has come where man, as a or as a boy or girl of his or her mother nature, should take care of the mother. Mother nature will not be affected if, like the dinosaurs, we the human will extinct from the earth. So be human, and it will come when we uh, assess the situation and look forward along with the sustainable thinking in peace. Now, uh, in fine, once again, I extend my sincere thanks to the organizers of Chagdaho College and to all the dear participants for their kind and patient hearing. Thank you all. Am I audible? Yes, yes, yes. So I finished my lecture. Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, I think I uh, finished my lecture on time. Dr. Okay. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Somnath Mukherjee, for your informative talk on fundamental issues of environment. Thank you so much. Now, the session is open for question and answering. I would like to request Rakhi Guho to conduct the question and answer session. Over to Dr. Rakhi Guho. Am I audible, sir? Yes, yes. First of all, thank you everyone for your present participation and push to our gratitude and a hearty welcome to all of you. In the sessions, many eminent and resourceable persons present with us. Actually, we have received so many relevant questions from the participants of today's webinar. But due to lack of time, we are not able to discuss all the questions. For this, we apologize. But we will discuss most relevant questions. Let's start. The first question is, why is protecting nature is important? From Titika Dash to Dr. Shomnath Mukherjee, sir. So over to Dr. Shomnath Mukherjee, sir. Uh, uh, Ma'am, can you repeat the question once again? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Why is protecting nature important? Okay. So, uh, uh, thank you for the uh, good question and uh, the pro uh, protection of the environment uh, is important for the sustenance of the whole organism or the sustenance of the whole uh, the nature uh, which is provided by our mother nature and uh, uh, we know that we are the human being and uh, as a human being we should realize that uh, our action should be uh, in a such a way, in a such a sustainable manner, so that uh, even uh, not uh, in this uh, age or in this time, but our future uh, is also uh, protected. Uh, our future generations will get uh, the benefit of uh, the earth resources. So uh, sustainability and the protection of the environment uh, should be from the uh, a kind of a uh, kind of a zine or a kind of a uh, corner or, or a kind of a uh, kind of a organism from the art uh, which is which are uh, most uh, the uh, important aspects and who, uh, they are the brains to cultivate even uh, for the sustenance of the world and uh, in the context of the climate change it is very much it is very much viable to protect uh, to stop and go uh, uh, the like thinking because we have to perceive one thing that we must we must stop for the awakening. I just told you that uh, for and then 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 surmise that uh, we uh, uh, that uh, uh, can we do a, be a better work for the uh, for the mother nature for the sustenance of both the human and the nature. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for helping us to understand this question with certain ease. The next, the last question, but not the least, the question is, how can ornamental fish spoilage be prevented to asteroid, from, from asteroid to Dr. Ashish Kumar Panigrahi, sir? 
Ashish Kumar Parigrahi sir. Ashish Kumar Parigrahi not uh, uh, present now. Uh, you can uh, go to the next question. Okay, okay. We bound to go to the next question. The next question is, what is the difference between microbiota and microbiome from Shubhajit Sharkar to Dr. Ra to Dr. Raju Esar Ajuri sir. So over to Dr. Raju Esar Ajuri sir. May I repeat this? Ajuri sir, are you present near here? Ajuri sir, are you present? I think uh, sir is not I'm here. Yeah. Okay, yeah. he's he's present. Okay, repeat, repeat the, the question. Okay, please okay, repeat the question. Okay, what is the difference between microbiota and microbiome? Both are same. Both words okay. are used interchangeably. They are same. They are essentially same. Okay, sir. I think participant got his answer. Due to the lack of time, now we have to end our question and session here. And I would like to request today's webinar host, Dr. Onipan Banerjee, sir. Please conduct the next program. And again, I am Raki Guha, thanking you all on behalf of Chagda College. Now over to Dr. Onipan Banerjee, sir. Thank you, Raki Guha. Now we have come to the end of the webinar. I would like to request Dr. Mondira Saha to deliver vote of thanks. Dr. Mondira Saha. Okay. Thanks to Dr. Oniban Banerjee. A warm and graceful evening to our Honorable Principal Ma'am, Dr. Shabuta Dash Mahanto, Secretary of this webinar, Dr. Shubhutosh Vishas, Joint convener of this international webinar, Dr. Istikar Alamshar and Dr. Onirvan Banerjee, our most valued invited speakers and all the participants. It's my privilege to have been asked to propose the vote of thanks on this international webinar as a joint program coordinator. I must mention our deep sense of appreciation to Professor Ashish Kumar Pandya sir for accepting invitation as a speaker in this webinar. We all are inspired by you and all of your great regard. But that we are grateful to Professor Pial Vasuroy for sharing your knowledge and experience. We may like to express our sincere thanks to Dr. for sharing us with his findings and opinion. We may like to express our sincere thanks to Dr. Raju for sharing his valuable suggestion. We are also very grateful to Dr. Shomnath Mukherjee for pressing your important speech. Sir. Finally, I would like to take this opportunity to place on record our hearty thanks to Dr. Shavta Dash Mohanto and Honorable Principal of Chagda College for the perfect logistic support and the guidance as she extends to all of us as this international webinar. Now, I also extend my thanks to Dr. Iktikar Alam and Dr. Anirban Banerjee, the joint convener of this international webinar, for organizing in the, this international and the grand webinar. I also extend my thanks to Mr. Oni Roy, the technical assistant of this webinar, for his technical support and for smooth running of this webinar. I also extend to thank the, all the organizing committee members for their enormous cooperation within the organization of this gala event. We have been fortunate enough to be backed by a team very motivated and dedicated colleagues of Chaka College and a special thanks to the non-teaching staff of Chagda College for their unceasing support and coordination. I would like to thank all the participants who have been blessed us with their presence. I cannot thank everyone enough for their involvement and their willingness to take on this completion of this task beyond their comfort zone. Thank you very much. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Mundira Saha. Dear participants, your uh, heartfelt cooperation in this webinar are highly appreciated. Thank you for your enormous support. 
we are looking forward for your presence in the in our future events the feedback form will be given to your whatsapp group today the link will be active up to tomorrow 12 noon thank you once again stay safe good night jai hind jai bharat thank you thank you काम करो